The quest for a new national minimum wage has been on for several years and the uncertainty of an average Nigerian worker to receive 30,000 Naira as the minimum seems to be disturbing. Hello and welcome to Labour Lens. I am Sharon Ijason. The conversation continues in a moment. The battle line is drawn between organized labor and government over agitations for a reviewed minimum wage for workers. While labor believes economic realities have made an upward review of wages inevitable, the government says it is more concerned about sustaining heavier recurrent expenditure. When President Muhammadu Buhari disclosed his plan to float a technical committee before federal lawmakers in December, Labour kicked, describing it as a tactical way to further delay the process leading to implementation of a new wage. Weeks down the line, President Buhari has inaugurated that committee with a mandate to come up with sustainable sources of funding and plans for implementation. But Labour says it is not disturbed by the mandate of the committee since it is far from being a negotiation panel. We are not members of the committee. The committee is not a negotiating machinery. Uh, my only surprise is that uh, I have heard that among the terms is to look for fund. If it's to look for fund, we should not tell government how to look for funds. I think the most sacrosanct thing for us right now is uh, waiting and watching to keep that the government keeps faith with the agreement reached that the bill will be transmitted on or before 23rd of this month. Experts are also dissecting the seeming face-off between the government and organized labor over the proposed minimum wage. Other workers bear their opinion as to how the Rwanda-led advisory committee will approach its task. What the labor are fighting for? Is their right in the sense that you know Nigeria, the way Nigeria is today, that minimum is even too small for the president to even look for funds elsewhere. I'm even surprised. What President Buhari did towards the concept of the minimum wage is a welcome development and it is the right step towards the right direction on the 30,000. I'm fully in support of the committee because he's not a fool, he knows they are capable of delivering. That is why he set up that committee. Nigeria ranks among the lowest paid workers in sub-Saharan Africa. It is in that category with the likes of Burkina Faso, Burundi, Chad, Ethiopia and Kenya. Ghana, Senegal, Lesotho, Swaziland, Democratic Republic of Congo and Zambia are on the table of lower middle income economies. For now, the Nigerian government has been able to prevail on labor to suspend its planned nationwide strike with a timeline for the delivery of the bill to the parliament in Abuja. Inadequate funding, dilapidated infrastructure, lack of modern equipment, and the rising rate of infant and maternal mortality. The list of challenges facing Nigeria's healthcare sector goes on and on. The National President of Health Workers Association believes that professional administrators must be made to manage health facilities. Where health management was removed from hospital administrators to medical doctors, then the tide started changing and it started nose diving to where we are. So until we revert back to where professional health managers begin to manage our health institutions, especially the public health institutions, we can't get it right. The issue goes beyond administration. Inadequate funding is also a major challenge. Nigeria's budgetary allocation to the healthcare sector is one of the lowest in West Africa. Health workers see this as a sign of lack of commitment by the government. The managers of the health system is privatization, privatization, PPP and all whatnot. PPP is failing in places. But that is what they are trying to import into the health system without getting the cognizance of the fact that the purchasing power of the health, the, the, the citizenry here, is not strong enough to allow government to pull its hands off health financing until 
this country manages and sees health services as service to the poor, we won't get it right. The occasion is the commissioning of the union's office in Gombe. But the power rates of the labor leaders are improving the welfare of their members and for Nigerians to have better health care delivery. For the union vessels. The Joint Health Sector Union has announced that it will resume its suspended industrial action on Thursday, 31st, 2019. In a letter addressed to the Minister of Labor and Employment, Dr. Chris Ingige, the group said it was resuming the strike following the failure of the federal government to address and resolve the issues it raised earlier. The Joint Health Sector Union suspended an industrial action on May 30th, 2018. Joetsu's demands are the upward adjustment of Conan's salary structure, unjust withholding of the salaries of Joesu members for the month of April and May 2018, headship of hospitals departments, not promotion of members of Conan's 1415 as directors in some federal health institution and implementation of consultancy CADA for members. On the profile interview segment this week, I will be speaking with the Director General of the Nigeria Employers Consultative Association. He will be giving us insight on the social, economic and labor issues in the country. Take a listen. It's good to have you on the program. Same here. And congratulations on your appointment as the new DG of NECA. Thank you very much. A lot is happening in the labor space, in the workspace, and we also know that when you talk about um, the work industry, we talk about government, we talk about NECA, yeah. then we talk about the workers' union. Yeah. Yes. Top of the moment right now is the issue of minimum wage. Absolutely. And we know that um, Nigerian workers deserve more than 18,000 naira, according to what the indices on ground. With the indices on ground also right now, there's every possibility that um, Nigerian workers won't have a new national minimum wage. This is because on the 23rd of January, yeah. when the president wants to submit the Tripartite Committee report, on the 24th of January, we are going to have the National Assembly closing yes. for electioneering process. What's your take on this? Well, the, the thank you for the congratulatory message and the good wishes. I appreciate that. With regards to the national minimum wage, whether it is deserved or not is another issue for discussion. But like I usually tell whoever cares to listen, there is also the issue of morality. 18,000 Naira is simply not a living wage to say the least. Having agreed at the Tripartite Committee on Minimum Wage Setting to pay 30,000 Naira, which we believe is fair and still not convenient by the, by the responses of the state governments, one expects that by now we will have gone beyond the issue of transmitting a bill to the National Assembly and National Assembly will have done due diligence and as recommended or proposed by private sector, the implementation date will have started from 1st of January 2019. But it remains to be seen when the implementation date will even be. Because like you rightly said, the bill has not been transmitted not to talk of the National Assembly sitting on it. And who knows, with the political in the here, how long it's going to take the National Assembly. But they have given their word that they find a way of fast-tracking and delivering on passing the bill as soon as it gets to them. And we have no doubt that they will do exactly that. If they want to make it happen, of course, even 
through committee works and the executive uh, sitting, they can make that happen. Okay, moving forward and also talking about the issue of the minimum wage. Some few weeks ago, we had um, organized labor yes. holding mass rallies across the country. What happens if organized labor decides to go on a strike? If the indices does not change, if the National Assembly does not expedite um, the enactment of a new national minimum wage, how will this affect the employer? How much does Nigeria lose when we decide to go on an industrial action? In fact, the concern of the organized business uh, in the private sector all along had been to avert the threat of strike or even the strike taking place in the first instance. There was a three days a warning strike late last year, which had devastating effect on businesses. And billions of Naira was lost by business uh, concerns. Organized businesses are yet to recover from, from the effect of just three days warning strike. And that was why we worked hard in cooperation with organized labor to avert the last threat of strike. There is no gain saying that the effect will be devastating, especially on organized businesses. It is what they produce, that they sell, that they go to the bank with, and that they use in sustaining continued employment of the masses of Nigerians that are in their employment. Unlike government agencies that have a budgetary appropriation or provisions to support their expenditure profile, Organized businesses do not have that. And it's it just unthinkable what damage will be done, especially thinking of the fact that we are in a very fragile economy that's just recovering from recession. And there is also that risk of slipping back into recession if we should have another strike. And it's not an empty speculation. It is very real. And of course, it's not just organized businesses that will be affected. The entire Nigerian masses will be impacted adversely one way or the other. And of course, the issue of the high rate of unemployment. It's not unlikely that many more will join the labor market. That's the unpleasant scenario. But it's the truth that we have to face. So, and that is why NECA, as representative body of organized business, has actually been pleading and lobbying both government and labor for everybody to play their own part to ensure that they en uh, entrench industrial harmony and avert whatever industrial disharmony could result from any strike or disagreements or industrial disputes. Hmm. From what you said, it's obvious that the issue of unemployment is a big um, problem that um, Nigerian workers are faced with, especially yes. the youth. Yes. It's either you're underemployed or you don't have a job. Yes. Um, professionally, is there any advice you can give to any government of the day in terms of getting it right, in terms of engaging people, be it um, skill-based or be it a regular office work? We, we commend government's efforts at creating employment. But we are stressing for the opt-in time that the issue of focus on white collar job is not the way to go, it's not the solution. And we keep saying that from research and study out there, there are jobs and there are vacant positions, especially in many untapped and underdeveloped areas. However, we do not have manpower that has the requisite skill to fill these particular positions or gaps that are in the labor market. And that was why NECA, in partnership with relevant bodies, have deepened their intervention in technical skills development projects. Because we discovered that once you are able to scale up the skills of these youths, to be able to fit into available job spaces, it has the tendency of reducing massively the unemployment uh, scourge in the uh, workspace. 
Now, the intervention of NECA and ITF, for instance, in technical skills development projects is limited because of the scope of uh, funding that's available. And we've called on government that the federal government could take it as a pilot scheme and enlarge and expand it, adequately fund it to ensure that more skilled labor are provided to fit into industry and block, block the gap to make our youth employable. The second aspect of it, which NECA is also strengthening, is the issue of encouraging our youth to be interested in becoming entrepreneurs in their own right. And because of that, we had instituted or started a program that we call NECA Preneurship, which is an online solution to train youth to be entrepreneur-minded and to also not only be gainfully employed immediately after their former education, but to also graduate into being employers of labor. And with all these concerted efforts, we believe we are contributing a quota in tackling the um, unemployment uh, problem. In a recent um, release by NECA, NECA has expressed um, its dissatisfaction or its concerns or concern over the increase in the nation's debt burden. What are the implications of this? Well, the implication is far-reaching because from the budgetary proposal of government for 2019, which has been sent to the National Assembly, debt servicing alone takes 12.140 trillion naira. While capital expenditure takes 2.031 trillion. In other words, what is being voted to service debt, 2.140 trillion, is more than what you spend on capital expenditure. This is very unhealthy. That's the first implication. In other words, there is no way you pay lip service to developmental projects, which will also impact directly in the life of the ordinary citizen without applying adequate capital into it. Rather, you discover that a larger chunk of the budget is going to debt servicing. That's one. The second one, which is also of concern, is that even traditionally, you work to leave resources for your generations to come, not to pile up debts and allow them. It's like uh, a sense of irresponsibility to create problems for the future generation. And we think this is also unethical and unhealthy. However, what government has said, which we agree with, is that yes, all the foreign loans that they are sourcing or bonds that are being floated are to provide critical infrastructures which will last into the foreseeable future. This is productive. However, we want to encourage government not to deepen the debt profile further, rather to work towards exiting most of these debts, at least for the benefit of the future generation. And on what we can do, specifically as a government of Nigeria, to make things work, especially with regards to issue of recurrent expenditure, because when you look at the budget proposal as well, the recurrent expenditure is huge. While you have 2.031 as your capital expenditure, recurrent expenditure is a whooping 4.040 trillion. And what comes to mind readily is the cry of NECA over the years that government should reduce the cost of governance. And no tangible effort is being made towards this. And government. Governance is a continuum. We know the last administration set up the Orosaye panel. They are advised on the merger of some ministries and the scrapping of some parastatals who are performing duplicating roles. And this has the potential of cutting massively on government uh, spending on governance. And we expect government and we urge government to look in this direction to see that they implement such laudable programs that will cut on the massive cost of governance. 
And there are several other frivolous expenditures too that, when you just look at the breakdown of the budget, you see frivolous expenditures that are just untenable and cannot be explained. That you believe that if government does a due diligence, they will eliminate unnecessary wastages. Talking about the budget which you just uh, mentioned about, yes. the 2019 budget, have you seen it? Have you accessed the, it? The proposal, yes. 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 What's your take on it? Do you think it's going to solve um, our economic problems? Well, the, the first observation is even that the benchmark, uh, the indices upon which the budget is premised, some of them are faulty. If you benchmark your oil price on $60, and even as we speak, oil prices has dipped below $60, and your budget deficit already, even if oil price performed at $60, the budget deficit is already at 1.853 trillion naira. It means it's going to be more deepened and you don't plan to fail. I've been issue, even before you start implementation, you are already seeing traces that, look, this is a budget that may actually not perform. So, but the good thing is that Implementation has not started. Even the budget has not been passed by the National Assembly. Both the National Assembly and the Executive should come together and take a look at the indices to say, OK, because the chunk of the budget, especially the oil income that is being expected, oil revenue is 3.70 uh, uh, trillion, which is not realizable if the price of oil continues this way. We expect government, both at the legislative and executive arm, to come together to do realistic indices and look at all these variables and realign to make sure that we have a realistic budget. From a technical perspective, if we agree that um, there is a downward turn in terms of um, the performance of the oil um, produce, which yes. Nigeria is actually dependent on, is there anything, any advice you can give in terms of diversification? Well, government is actually trying with regards to diversification. But Even what would you be expecting from states? Because most states are really dependent yes, I, 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 on the I'm, federal I'm, government I'm, allocation. I'm coming to that. Just like government has done well with its diversification and intensified agricultural revolution, we expect states to key into it. Some states have keyed into it. Many youths are gainfully employed in agricultural ventures. And agri is just one aspect of avenues for non-oil revenue. There are several other aspects. Yes, uh, Nigeria Custom and FIRS are doing well with raking of revenue. But what of actually the risk sector of the economy? What is government actually doing to help the risk sector of the economy to contribute significantly to the GDP? And apart from that, other non-oil sector like mining, for instance, we have huge potential in mining. Government should invest massively in mining. And one way they can do it is to deregulate, devolve responsibilities to the states. I know this may be a constitutional issue, but government, if government summons the political will to get this done, it's possible. Allow states to have active role, and that will solve the issue of every month you are capping nuns going to Abuja to collect a, uh, allocations from federal posts, rather than being a contributor to the post itself. And this also brings us to the issue of true federalism, where every state arms of every level of government, including the local government, is expected to pay, play their role. And that also takes us to the issue of devolution of power. So that power is not only concentrated at the center. Everybody has roles. And my advice is that we take a second look at our constitution and implementation of it before the advent of military in 1966 and see how our governance structure was how every region were performing their roles and we were in sync 
with good tenets of governance, and everybody was happy and contributing to the economy. And I think we should go back. If you discover that your present is not favorable, you cannot continue to do the same thing and expect a different result. We should take a look what were those things we were doing right under our system before 1966, which we should imbibe. Finally, I have this special concern yes. in terms of safety in workplaces. Yeah. I know that NECA has a plan towards ensuring that employers of labor actually meet up in terms of, um, in terms of compensation. What more do you have in line, well, 2019 and beyond? As you are aware, NECA, in partnership with uh, uh, Nigeria Social Insurance Trust Fund, had uh, started some years back a project that we call SWEEP is a safety in workplace uh, initiative that encourages organized businesses in the private sector to embrace the culture of uh, safety for the benefit of their workers and visitors to the workplace. And what do we do? Specifically, we reward excellence in safety, those who have embraced safety culture. There are instances when we've given ambulances to also show up their safety practices. We give safety infrastructures to those who have gaps in their safety culture so that it can help them meet uh, all those needs that will ensure appropriate and adequate safety in the workplace. And we've also organized training programs to train safety officers and workers with functions that is related to safety and hygiene in the workplace. And these are contributions to ensuring that we inculcate that culture of safety and uh, hygiene in the workplace. And this is not a one-off event. It is what we do every year and we intend to deepen it this year, starting with what we usually do, we conduct safety audit to find out the state of safety in our different uh, workplaces. Then it gives us the opportunity to have insight into the position and what to do to help this uh, world of work to actually improve on their safety. We will intensify and continue with that. We are doing this in partnership with uh, the NSITF and we are also carrying along the Inspectorate Division of the Federal Ministry of Labor that we are using for the purpose of uh, auditing the workplace. Okay. It was an interesting conversation I had with you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And that's all we can take on today's edition of the program. Join us next week for a fresh edition of the show. I am Sharon Ijasson. Thanks for watching and remember, labor creates wealth.